Hello everyone and welcome to Sid's Foodcast, the food podcast where me and my guests would talk about food, our love for food, and everything in the name of food. This is your host, Sid, and welcome to the show. For today's episode, we will have Gino Paradella, where we're going to talk about food and its connections to religion, spirituality, and culture. Enjoy the episode. Last meal I had before the episode is uh, typical Cebuano pork chop. You know, the kind of pork chop that is dry because it's like deep fried and then it becomes dry because it's like um, it's dried on top of, you know, the, the, that of super absorbent tissue paper. So, you know, <laughs> it starts off oily and then it, it becomes really dry. And then I had rice and then um, we, had, we had soup, I think. Yeah, miswa. You know oh, what miswa is? I love is? miswa. It's, oh my god! It, it's basically like the sardinas. You have like canned it's sardines. And sardinas. Oh my god! <laughs> it's so yeah, good, like, man. Yeah, <laughs> we had that for dinner. Oh so my. basically, I enjoyed it, and then I had tea. You know, oh. from Lipton. Oh, I love I love miswa with sardinas. Is miswa? <laughs> I don't know. Is miswa the noodles? Is that yeah, miswa is the noodles. It's really really, really thin noodles. Mm-mm. And then there's like another kind of miswa. There's what we call udong. Which is actually oh. thicker noodles, you know. I Maybe think is it got that from udon. Got that from, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think but so. In, in in colloquial Visaya, we call it udon. But I think it's from udon, and then we just <laughs> added the g. <laughs> I think so too. Yeah. Oh my God, miswa. I don't remember the last time I had it, but it's <laughs> really really good. I don't like the plain miswa with the clear broth. Or the oh yeah, no, no. I like the one with the orangey. Yeah, with the sardines. Oh, because with the sardines, it's so good. Yeah. Um, I'm not and a it's fan. It's very cheap. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's, a, it's a very cheap meal. <laughs> not a fan with um dried pork chop though. Um, I don't know. Um, um, I kind of like it if if you, you make your pork chop, make it either like deep fry or a crunchy. Or like obviously that's super sinful, but um, if listen magud siya i pan fry na yeah yeah it's ah uh, kuan siya na gahi mag magahi yeah. jud siya tayo it's it's really difficult. Um, what I had, um, I did not know technically what I had. What I what I had from work is basically is rice, condensed milk, and um, cinnamon. <laughs> so it's a dessert. Wow. Yeah. So it's basically. Rice. Uh-huh. Okay. It's basically horchata, but not a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and like, cause I love horchata. I like I have uh, I lo- um for people who do not know what horchata is, it's basically a uh, a Mexican agua fresca that's um cooked. Uh, that no no not cooked. It's made with um rice. You kind of um, blitz it in the blender. And then you put cinnamon sticks and Ooh. and condensed milk, a lot of condensed Ooh. milk. Oh my, so that sounds good. It's so fucking good. I swear to God, it's so good. So and after after you're done blending it, what does it look like? It's like milkshake? it's like a it's like a vanilla ish drink. Oh, oh so cool. It, so uh, it tastes like what? Bland like rice with a bit of sweetness. No, it and tastes. With a bit of cinnamon. I, I don't. Um, it tastes like hmm. I don't know. You get that that sweetness from the rice, and then you have condensed milk, man. Good. So it's yeah. the mixture of the condensed milk and the rice. Oh, but then, but the rice is soaked with cinnamon sticks okay. overnight. So you get that hint of cinnamon. Ah, there's this cinnamony flavor. Uh, cinnamony flavor, and then you kind of sprinkle cinnamon on top. Ah. So I, that. I'm not. I'm. I'm not a big fan of cinnamon. <laughs> I, I like I love cinnamon and oh, really? but you can, yeah but you can have it with um it's it's what we call a dirty or orchata you mix it with with coffee so you can have it with coffee so that's a dirty heart orchata and you could have it with almond milk I guess like you, oh. you can have like uh, mixtures with orchata but it's it's a main agua fresca or a cold drink for um for especially Spanish and Latinos. 
here in California, especially in, in Mexico, it's a really, really good drink. I even have a dream that like, I'm going to have my own horchata stall in, in, in Cebu <laughs> one day. You know? it, Maybe you should. <laughs> that, that, that sounds awesome. Man. Oh, uh, I'd like to taste really, that. Yeah, it's really, really good, man, for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> go, going on to our main topic of discussion, um, why did I choose a spirituality and food? Because, again, when, uh, when I messaged uh, Gino, and really, at the top of my head, there's a lot of things that that we that we could connect to food and spirituality. Um, when, for example, the most obvious thing would be when when it comes to Christianity, we remember um, we remember the Last Supper mm. you know, and how it's being um, celebrated in the Holy Eucharist and and and. Um, and mass um we remember um even like the breaking of the bread you know it's very very important and but that's that's still the last supper um um another thing i would remember is i just texted this to my friend um francis because i was like i was kind of oh what are the things that we, we could talk about and then i remembered um i remembered that bible story when um what was about Cain and Abel when Cain and when Abel offered um, um, the sacrificial lamb mm. and then Cain offered fruits and vegetables and God favored Cain, uh, Abel. Abel. And then I was just like, so is God not vegan? <laughs> 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 so, he, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's like an affirmation from heaven that, you know. <laughs> So why does he like um, a dead lamb over, you know, <laughs> over fruits and vegetables? <laughs> but but Francis told me like um, Abel offered his best lamb, but mm. you know, uh, but Cain, Cain offered, gave the, the know, bad so, like grain. the leftovers. Mm. Yeah. Um, what else do I know with um, with food and um, yeah that one and what else? Oh shoot, the manna. You know, um, yeah, the manna you know, from um, heaven, God, you know, sacred uh, bread from heaven. Yeah, God um, decided to like overnight. He would like well, shower manna from heaven, and mm. then told the the Israelites to not save it because it's gonna be bad after. But you know, if if what we could recall with the Israelites, <laughs> they're pretty hard to kind of. <laughs> follow the rules <laughs> we all remember the 10 commandments <laughs> and what happened when moses went down the mountain <laughs> but yeah like you know it was it would taste it tasted like cake i guess like that was like the description of manna and then they saved it but god said don't save it and then you know the next day it turned like maggots were eating manna you know but my take is like if you're gonna serve manna every day, it's like obviously, yeah. You know. And <laughs> the, the, the Israelites also, call, you know, they called on God. They complained. They kept kept on eating manna, and they said, "Oh, we don't want to eat this anymore." And God sent quails. So God alternated between manna and quails. So. Um, what else? What else do I know about food and spirituality? Obviously, in different religions, uh, when it comes to um, Jews, with with being kosher. Um, Islam with you know the halal. halal and uh, I guess that's like the the that's you also what have I the have. prohibition uh, in in some in some Hindu societies, especially those right. who worship the god Krishna, they have a very strong taboo against um, the consumption of beef because mm-hmm. the beef is an animal sacred to the god Krishna. So anyway. Right. Let's right. let, let, let me give you a segue. When, when, when we actually talk about food and spirituality, I think it's important to talk about what food and what spirituality is. So mm-hmm. what is food? What makes food food? You know, when I was young, I, I had always been fascinated with the concept of foodness. So what makes, for example, uh, what makes the, 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 the bread that the priest holds and, uh, and the wine that the priest holds different than you know the typical wine that you drink and the bread that you eat in you know in la vie parisienne so what makes that different so there must be something in the bread and in the wine that is in the christian mass that that sets it apart so 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 if if you notice christianity is an eating based religion 
Uh, <laughs> let me give you metaphors. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. Now, what does the word Bethlehem mean? It means the house of bread. Oh, now, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, the house of bread. Now, notice where Jesus was actually swaddled when he he was born from when he 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 was born. A Mary manger, put him right? in a manger. So, what is a manger? So that were like like lambs and sheep. No, like, a manger is a food trough. Oh, it's the tray where you put the hay so that the animals will eat, and. Mm-hmm. You can see the symbolism of bread. You know, mm-hmm. all throughout the life of Jesus of Nazareth, there's the symbolism of bread from bread. the first mm-hmm. first chapter of Matthew to the birth of Jesus. And then in John 6, you have Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. He who eats of, eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood will have life within him. Right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, Preach. and yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and when Jesus, uh, before, the, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he gave it thanks he said break this you know take this all mm-hmm. of you and eat of it this is my body right mm-hmm. and after the resurrection when he was resurrected and the story goes that you know he was an, an entirely different person and then all of a sudden the apostles knew him because he broke the bread in a distinct mm-hmm. manner so bread is a very you know bread is very important in the story in the bible the manna is bread Jesus is bread. So what gives with the bread? No. So we will what's, talk about what's that up later with on. bread. You know? What's up with bread? <laughs> so anyway, um, let me give you a quotation from a book that I thoroughly enjoyed. It's uh, by the anthropologist Peter Farb and George Armin. I cannot pronounce his name. Armin Armilagos. I think that's how you read it. But basically, the book is entitled "Consuming Passions: The Anthropology of Eating." So, so. <laughs> Um, Farb and Armilagos actually said, food, to a large extent, is what holds a society together. And eating is closely linked to deep spiritual experiences. So think of it this way. Human beings are the only animals that do not just simply eat. Human beings don't eat because they want to fill their stomach. Human beings dine. We do not eat we dine. we dine. So there's a difference. Uh, this is what the anthropologist Cloud Levi, Levi Strauss said, that there's a difference between typical eating and dining. Why is it, Strauss would ask, that uh, when we have communal, communal group encounters, there's always food involved? Why is it that when you like this particular person, you would say, hey, let's go out for a cup of coffee? Mm-hmm. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. Or if you like this girl, if you like this guy, and then you say, hey, would you like to go out to dinner? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And because you like this person, it's their birthday, you give them a cake. cake. For For some reason, food plays a very special and a particular role. Again, let's go back to what Farb and Armalago said. They said that food is what holds society together. Food is actually something that is symbolic. So if, if, if we consume something, it means that we are opening up ourselves to another person. So eating is not just simply me wanting to be full. It's me wanting to know the other. So, For sure. Yeah, yeah that, that is, that's what makes food so fascinating because food is so tied with culture. You know, the best thing that you can offer a guest if you plan on going to another place or to another country, I think, is to actually eat their food. And I think even if you don't speak Vietnamese, for example, mm-hmm. or if you don't speak um, Thai or whatever... But when you eat their food and, 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 and the person who's serving sees that you're enjoying the food, for some reason, something happens. Something magical happens. Mm-hmm. You're like linked together in the you, act of it's eating. The extension of yourself, like yes, I would like exactly. say. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Food is an extension of a culture. It is, it is the sum total of our total experiences. You know, oh. they said that if you want to travel... The best way to do travel is to eat their food. Because if you want to understand the entire culture of a people, you eat their food. So you don't have to go to India in order to understand a bit of what India is. You can always taste India. Mm-hmm. Right? The mouth is a very powerful organ because the mouth not only gives forth words, it also takes in through food. Oh, that's right? beautiful. What is, 
you know, if you're a Cebuano, one of the greatest insults that you can do with your uh, do to your guests is to reject their hospitality by not eating their food. Mm-hmm. Cebuanos actually have what we call the dance of the dance of the tango of denial of you know being fed. For example, <laughs> have you noticed that it's a very Uh-oh. Filipino trait? It's a very Filipino trait. Kumain ka na ba? Hindi pa. Ah, halika kain tayo. Oh, okay lang, okay lang. <laughs> okay lang, okay lang. Okay lang. You are expected to, more or less, you are expected to say no. Mm-hmm. So if a person will not insist, it means that, oh, okay. But if a person keeps on ex- insisting, then it would be rude to say no. Mm-hmm. Because by not eating the food, you are saying that you are not a nice guest. That yeah. I do not trust you. That <laughs> I do not want to, ex- you know, I do not want to understand you deeper through your cooking. The best compliment that you can give your mom is actually compliment their cooking. For sure. Yeah. Because again, as what you said, Sid, the food is an extension of a person. And I mm-hmm. think that is a, a very powerful image because food is what, you know, draws us together. It's right. our common bond. Mm-hmm. And, so, and, and, and I guess like to, to backpack or to add on what you said, it's really just when humans just do not eat because, you know, it's, it's, all, it's an experience. You know, we mm-hmm. can think of... You know, we could think of a lot of instances when we eat something, there will be moments where you kind of remember a certain memory. And oh, yeah. the point that you would associate a certain meal, like, oh, uh, I don't want to order that because that was what we ordered when my, my girlfriend and I broke up. Or like, or like, um, um, like I don't want to have that because like something more physiological, like, oh, because I, cause I had, had diarrhea. Oh yeah, like something like you know, that. I had that when I. You're familiar with um, larang. Uh huh. You know, larang mm-hmm. is like my favorite fish-based dish, but it has been I think two years. No, not two years. A year since I last ate it. The main reason was I bought it at my favorite store, the nearby Gaisano Metro. You know, just the street stall, mm-hmm. and it is so good. I kept on eating, and then the next day, I had diarrhea. And it lasted for almost a week. Oh, no. And I went to the hospital. I went to the ER and I was dehydrated. So mm. that, that was the end of the larang for me. So every time I see the larang, there's like this. You remember oh. the ER? Yeah, I, I remember the ER. So, it, 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 you know, you can associate things with it. <laughs> right, right. And um, again, um, that was like really insightful when you talked, when we started talking about how um, food is more than just putting it in your mouth and you know mm. just eating it that kind of differs us to i guess like animals like oh, we yes, experience it we experience these memories we can connect to different cultures and then we get to understand a little bit on even from you know even from understanding the ingredients that were used and to the point on how it's cooked it's a whole story, you know. It's it's a whole story. It, it could be as simple as the the adobo, you know. Um, it could be, you know, uh, it could be like made because of out of necessity, like the budejige, you know, the the What's Korean army. The Does budejige is the like? Korean army stew. That's oh. like the soup with noodles, spam, kimchi. Oh. Oh, so, that's what it's called. Yeah, it's Korean army stew <laughs> because it's basically what the Koreans used during the Korean War, and oh. they kind of ate whatever what was like the what was available during when Amer- the Americans came, and they kind of yeah. gave whatever they had. They kind of put whatever it is that they have and put it in the pot. So they had instant noodles. Also, oh, it's had, like a it's like a hot pot, but. Uh, <laughs> More liberal, you know, and yeah. you can put every anything you want. Mm, right, but we but they had that one because it was made out of necessity, bec- and they they only had they can only put what they had. So in, in with the Koreans, they have the the enoki mushrooms, the kimchi, mm. the oh, what else, the the topoki. But then they also added the you know the spam. They added sausages. Mm. which were like you know they were brought they were, by the americans they were, they were also in cans so they yeah better. <laughs> so like that like it tells the story but like we appreciate oh we eat with the chicken but we did but you know knowing how it's made 
you know, something like that, or like even like Air de Air de Royal in in France, where it's made for the king who didn't have any teeth. And so they need <laughs> they needed to make a dish so soft that the king could eat it. So like you know, it's really interesting. <laughs> like you don't just eat it like in a way, but there's a lot of like stories that comes into it. You know, like I guess like that goes with with again the Philippines and the adobo. When we go to Luzon, when we go to, they have their own type of adobo. There's like adobo sukang puti na adobo. Then when we come to to, to Cebu, there's like. We have our own spin on it. You know? Yeah, the dry one. <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting, and 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 again, it's not just about the culture, but it was also even to the point that it is, you know, it is spiritual and mm. it is ingrained with a religion, you mm. know. And again, what, what a wonderful um, um, description and discussion when it comes to Christianity and food. It's I I re- really agree, man. Like it's it's we really do eat. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's actually a part of the Christian experience. Now, when you actually look at uh, Roman Catholicism, one of the key features of Roman Catholicism is the concept of the fiesta. Uh, oh. The fiesta is basically, it, you know, people don't eat first prior to going to mass. So mm-hmm. when a person goes to Mass, the person does what we call in Catholic theology, or in, not really theology, but in Catholic practice, we call it the Eucharistic fast. In pre-Vatican II, I think it was 12 hours. Prior to going to Mass, you're not allowed to eat anything or oh. drink anything. Yeah, and okay. so the first food that you eat is actually the Eucharist. And then oh, um, okay. during fiestas, uh, you go to Mass, obviously, and then you take the Eucharist. After you're nourished by the Eucharist, you then nourish the social component of your body by going out and partying with people. So oh. food is always a part of culture and society. Dude, now, that is so um, interesting. <laughs> there, there, is, there is no human gathering. There is no human gathering without food. Have you ever <laughs> went out on a date with someone and just watched a movie without having coffee or bringing popcorn? Right. No, no. No, really. There's right? always because, something to eat. You know, there's always something to eat. No matter how small... There's always something to eat. That's why they would say that, you know, uh, there's this typical Filipino uh, idea that, you know, Oi, may, may jowa ka na, tataba ka na. <laughs> they would say that, you have a girlfriend, you, mm-hmm. you will grow fat. Because exactly, every social interaction you have with that significant other involves food. I mean, you can, you can, you can attest to that with your wife. Right. Yeah, for sure. Whenever we kind of have anything going on, we eat. <laughs> yeah, you eat. <laughs> because eating is it, it it's it's basically a way of socialization. Um, I don't really know why that is, but my theory here is that um, when we were still in our infancy as humans in in the plains of sub-Saharan Africa, what I think happened was that um, when we found out or we figured out how fire is made and we knew how to make fire, then we had leisure time. We had leisure time because before when the sun would set life would stop but Mm -hmm. with the advent of fire life does not stop because now we have an artificial sun oh right right and now because of our artificial sun we can gather around that artificial sun and we will be protected from the wild animals and at Mm -hmm. the same time we can use that artificial sun that heat source to cook our food and as our food is cooking we get to talk. All right. And, and I think that is where it all started. Oh. It all started with that concept of leisure. And it carried over from generation to generation to generation. Because <laughs> this is what we call in anthropology as a cultural universal. Mm-hmm. When people eat, universally, there, you know, when people gather, universally, there's food. Oh, man. Knowledge. <laughs> yeah. I, I found that very fascinating you know when, when my professor when my professor told us that uh when i forgot who, which professor i think it was dr nolasco from the university of san carlos when dr nolasco said there is no human gathering without food i i i tried to think of a human gathering without food when i say human gathering something that is deliberately orchestrated by different mm-hmm. people 
So, for example, your barcada and you agree that you, you know, you see each other. And then I thought about it. Bitausa? Mm-mm. I could not think of any that's, that does not in, you know include food. You know when you when you go out with your high school friends or with your college barcada, you you go to a coffee shop, mm-hmm. or you go to a donut shop, or if you're not if you're really hungry, you go to a Korean restaurant, or right. if you're feeling adventurous, you might go to a Japanese restaurant or elsewhere. But there's always the food component, and I find that very fascinating. Without. Uh, Allow me to share something that I found in my old notes. This is from Bailey in 2014. It's just a citation, the index here. I forgot the, the full name of Bailey. But Bailey said this, Religion becomes a central component of ritual actions involving food preparation, especially cooking and consumption. When a higher power or spiritual authority is intentionally made a part of the ritual food process, in this way, cooking and eating take on meanings beyond nutritional and physical sustenance, becoming modes for interacting with the spiritual or the transcendent. So when we eat, as I said, when human beings eat, it's not just for nourishment. The nourishment factor is secondary. The, 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 the main thing here is to commune. Mm-hmm. That and, is why in, in, in Christian services, there's always the Eucharist. There's always the breaking of the bread because Jesus is made known to us through the breaking of the bread. And when we partake of the Eucharist, we are partaking of the body and blood of Christ, which is symbolically everyone who is gathered in that vicinity. Mm-hmm. So we are in communion in a sense. And you also do that in different food, as I said earlier. Right. So, and, and, uh, sorry, sorry to cut you off, but when you, when we, when you, got, when you talked about, um, um, the fiesta and the fasting, uh, what, I don't know why, I, I kind of, I, I remember Ramadan. Yeah. And um, I, but one thing that I, one thing that I re- also remember is Bantayan Island for some reason, where <laughs> um, I know when it was, when it's Holy Week in the Philippines, I don't know if it's true now, but like they are the ones that they can eat meat. Have you have you heard of that one? Oh yeah, that uh, there there's this alleged dispensation from the Vatican, or so <laughs> the legend says, that they are given an opportunity to eat lechon or <laughs> roasted pork during um how do you call this during Good Holy, Friday. Mm, right. <laughs> I, I I'm not so sure if it's true. But I think it's a I think it's a cultural phenomenon. I, I think the main reason why they eat pork is not so much because the church says so or get granted them dispensation. It's mm-hmm. because when you look at Bantayan Island, Bantayan Island is basically an island. And being an island, mo- most of the food that they have are actually from the sea. Mm-hmm. So eating pork is actually a special thing. So when you eat pork, it is it is only served for communal and very important purposes. In very special occasions, exactly. And remember that Bantayanios, people who live in Bantayan, go home during Holy Week. And so the family is complete during Good Friday. So I think the main reason why the lechon is eaten, it, it's not so much because the church says so or the church mm-hmm. says it's okay. I think, I think they're just trying to reason it out. <laughs> <laughs> But personally, I think it comes from the desire to establish, as I said, communion. You know, you feel very special if you come from the city and then you go back home and then they prepare a feast for you. Because lechon, is in, in, in the Cebuano context, is not a cheap food. Mm-hmm. Lechon is expensive. You have to buy pork. I mean, you have to buy a pig. Uh, a pig is how much in today's money? 6000 oh, no. to 8000 yeah. And then you have to have a lechonero, a person who does the lechon. You have to slaughter the pig, and then you have to hire people. So it's a very expensive process mm-hmm. to have roasted pig. So that's a very special thing. It's a rare commodity in an island, and at the same time, it's offered for you. So, you know, it, it serves Why to strengthen yeah. and foster social ties. <laughs> right. And again, these are just like the, um, like not really to be technical about it, people, but um. Is this just interesting when we talked to, when, when, I, when I talked about Bantayan Island because they do have that kind of phenomenon and it's still connected to spirituality and 
another thing that I could connect to with spirituality. We always talk about spiritual food, nourishment, you know, these are adjectives that we use when we eat, you know, but we, we, but we use that one also for, for, you know, to, to strengthen or nourish your spiritual sense of self. And I guess that's uh, another, another interesting take when it comes to, you know, when it comes to food and, wellness i guess in in general but an, an uh a different uh take when i think of food and spirituality as well is i think of those witch witch doctors in like in in the bukid you know in the in the mountainous regions where they also kind of use food in like in like um i don't know doing their enchantments where they, they kind of like slaughter like the chicken and they don't necessarily eat it but like it's it's <laughs> like it's it's still there you know like making vials i guess from different yeah. ingredients and then ensuring that uh you know you make a concoction in in, in the mountains in cebu there's this concept of the manghihilo the poisoner i did a paper on that i think for lit class we had um we had oral interpretation of literature. I forgot which course was that. But basically, I made a study on the Manghihilo phenomenon. So basically, when you look at the Manghihilo phenomenon, it has something to do with food. And it also has something to do with taboos. So uh, in, in Cebuano folklore, there's this particular person who goes to the tabo or the market. You know, in the province, they have a tabo every week, right? And so people from the different parts, of the different little shanties and villages would gather together in the market. They would sell things, they would sell food. And accordingly, allegedly, they said that it is in these gatherings that a manghihilo would come. And the manghihilo would, would put poison on the tip of his or her finger and then put it on food. And <laughs> basically, um, basically, when you ingest it, you get sick. And the manghihilo is the only person who actually has the an antidote which can actually help you out. So they would say, oh, it's basically for, how do you call this? You know, they're, they're making money, they're making you sick so uh -huh. that they can make money. But the way I look at, I, I, the way I look at it, Sid, actually, is I think it reinforces what we call food taboos. Now, different societies have what we call taboos. Now, taboos, coming from a Melanesian word, tapu, which means forbidden, um, certain cultures have what they consider to be food and not food. For example, uh, if you've heard a while back, my dog was barking. In, mm -hmm. in the Philippine context, especially in Cebu, that animal that barked and is eating something on top of my slipper right now <laughs> is actually something that you cannot eat. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think the manghihilo enforces what we call communal taboos. There are certain food that you should not eat. For example, um, you should not eat this particular food because it's prone to manghihilo. I, I think if you have been in the province they would say don't eat at that carinderia you're a newcomer mm -hmm. if you eat at that carinderia you will get sick so i think it's also a way of reinforcing certain boundaries that you as a newcomer in the society ought to follow you are not ready for this yet you are you know your body can take the poison uh -huh. <laughs> you're not from here so so basically i think it's also a mechanism for a society to keep itself how do you call this to keep itself solid and to ensure that those who can eat belong to their own class of society. You know, that's just my two cents. You know, I, I'm not an expert on food, but you know, it's, ni it's nice to speculate about food. Right, because there's just a lot of things. So there's a lot of meaningful and even scientific or maybe just like our own personal take when it comes to food and spirituality. And our culture has a lot, a lot of insight yeah. when it comes to food. But uh, maybe in our second half of our discussion, or maybe before we close this, this, um, I mean, the last part of our discussion when it comes to food and spirituality, as we could, we could briefly talk about drinks as well, because obviously, um, drinks specifically, wine, tea, coffee, <laughs> coffee has definitely impacted our world. Oh yes, in such a way that. Um, countries are colonized yeah. wars are waged um, um country uh, like uh, empires collapse because of these yeah these these, these could be sound, sound so simple you know but it's not especially salt 
<laughs> yeah. You know, many empires war have fallen. <laughs> yes, because of salt. Right. Empires and... expand because of salt. Mm-mm. And because we, you know, uh, we could talk about the spice trade for hours, you know. Oh, but yeah. Yeah, we could talk well, that's about... an important point, the spices. Mm, right. And, 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 and India and... was colonized because of spices. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, um, and there's just a lot of history and it will take hours and hours. Oh, yeah. But, you know, the maybe, uh, what, you know, um, what would be when it comes to drinks and spirituality mm. or even history what what do you think what, what's on the top of your head when it comes to drinks what i think is the most fascinating drink that actually created i think the modern world is actually coffee <laughs> <laughs> right. this really bitter bean that grew <laughs> in the eastern part of africa and perhaps in the lower part of arabia I think is the single most important drink of the modern world that redefined the way we look at it, things. Because it started off as something that, you know, is just commonly drank in the Islamic world. Mm-hmm. And yet, you know, currently it's one of the fastest growing industries in the world. And I think what makes coffee fascinating for me is that, at least in the Filipino context, coffee has become a staple for the creation of, uh, the creation of societies the creation of friendships, the creation of relationships. Many a heart have been bro- has been broken because oh, of, let's talk, <laughs> let's go to the fo- coffee shop and talk. And you know, oh no, we're going to talk in a coffee shop. You know, you started in a coffee shop, you ended in a coffee shop. For some reason, coffee is there. Right. Because coffee is both bitter and sweet, so mm-hmm. so so I think yeah. it's a fitting symbol. <laughs> right. And for people who are listening to this podcast, I have a coffee episode. You can listen to that with Bay and Chu. Uh, we really talked about a lot about third wave coffee and all that. Just just third just a segue. <laughs> right. That's so cool. <laughs> right. I should listen to that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really, really interesting. Um, you know, you, you learn who the farmers are, where it comes from. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, how the process of it and it's really interesting and again to to kind of um supplement on what you said coffee has really really affected uh, uh the, the the world you know co- like oh, yeah like how the dutch colonies kind of started coffee as well and then they went to indonesia and then now indonesia yeah. is one of the biggest um, coffee, coffee exporters in the world um, well, you also have to consider that you know, a lot of farmland, especially um, a lot of forests have also been cleared because of coffee. Right. So there's also this economic impact that coffee has and our demand for coffee has. Right. So, so I, think, I think when we look at, you know, the history of the world can actually be told through a single fruit. And if we just follow that coffee bean, <laughs> or if we just follow that food, it will lead us somewhere in history. Oh my God. Thousands, millions have died because of that bean. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. That's really true. Right. You know, certain dishes can tell so much about the culture. For example, uh-huh. the, the history of curry is something that we need to talk about because, oh. you know, curry is a very, um, it's a specialized Indian spice. And yet we see curry all around Africa. We see curry all around Asia as well. So it tells us where trade started, where trade ended, how oh colonies God. were made, how colonies fell. And it's just, it's just because of curry. So, so <laughs> now, if, now, we follow, yeah, if we now, follow it, it will lead us somewhere. Now I want to think about taking that food anthropology class. It's really interesting. <laughs> well, yeah. um, um, another thing when I think of, of drinks and and history and culture and spirituality is, you know, when we think of Greek mythology and, you know, the, the drink from the gods, the, gods, yes, the, ambrosia. the ambrosia and in, in, in Norse mythology, how mead is very important in their lifestyle. Like you, we need that mead and just listening and like reading these stories, like oh. I don't know what the mead tastes like, but I want to try. Yeah, and in, in, in Greek, in, in ancient Egypt as well, beer plays a very important role in Egyptian mythology. 
and in oh, Egyptian life. Barley, right? Yeah, barley, bread and beer. Th- those oh. were the two important things in ancient Egypt. Right. And um, they, Greek, gr- Greek mythology, they even have a god for wine. For wine. <laughs> <laughs> Merrymaking, you know. <laughs> Dionysus. You know, it's, 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 I mean, if you think about it, it's like even ancient civilization, huh? Like, uh, yeah. like that. And of course, China has the tea. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, I guess like to act the cap, to cap things off with, with this discussion, uh, I remembered this, um, geographical map of tea and how it's spoken, how it's, how it's derived only from two words mm-hmm. it's whether tea or cha you know there's only two so it's either um tea i, I think tea is when it's spread through sea and then cha oh, through, cha land. through land so in like, the philippines we I call think, tea cha so it was cha-a. spread may, perhaps may, it, maybe yeah, maybe, maybe it's uh, the other way around <laughs> i'm not sure but no, it's no, something I, like I, that I think maybe it's because we have a more direct, how do you call this? Uh, we have a more direct trade with China. Right. So it did not go, you know, it did not pass through any middlemen. It's like hmm. China, Philippines. Right. Okay. Perhaps. Cha. Yeah. Cha. Cha. And then we have cha. cha. Then in, in, in Japan, they have ocha. Uh, and then, and then in London, there's tea. tea. And, oh, but then the, this, but then from China, then went to India, that's chai. <laughs> right so <laughs> really interesting how that's, that's really interesting <laughs> right? i'm a big fan of tea i love tea <laughs> me too and again tea and spirituality a lot you know especially oh, yeah. Jap- japan and their tea oh, yeah, ceremonies we forgot to talk about that you know <laughs> the, the, the centrality of tea in, in 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 zen buddhism what 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 started as just you know random court rituals became part of the religious service of, of 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 Zen Buddhism, you know, I I was able to join. Uh, I was actually able to join a tea ceremony in in in, in a nearby temple here, and I must say, it's really 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 slow. Like every <laughs> movement is deliberately slow for some reason because it tests your patience. You know, the first thing that they do is that they get the cup slowly, and then they pour hot water, and then they clean the cup they throw the hot water they put another you, you know it will take you 45 minutes just to be served with tea but the point here was in the act of doing it so yeah see, tea that, what does it teach you though it, te- it teaches you like patience or what appreciation it teaches you to be in the moment to not you know uh, the human mind in in you know the human mind wanders in in zen practice they call it the monkey mind i mean right I'm not, I'm not a Buddhist. I'm a Christian, um, but but what I'm trying to say, I love comparative religion. I, I also teach it. So so for the Buddhist, the point of the tea ceremony is to keep you centered on the present moment, not tied on what things happened in the past, and not tied with what will happen in the future. Because here, according to according to some some Zen teachers uh, that I know, they would say that our mind grasps. For routines especially with what happens next so after the pouring we know it's the doing that mm-hmm. and we anticipate that they would do right. it oh know. my god like we, right you know we, <laughs> there's this anticipation that you'll do it right away mm-hmm. but the, the but the point of the tea ceremony is to how do you call this is to exhaust your mind to stop thinking about what will happen next but to just look at the movements and just be there and Voila! You're you're oh in a state god. of bliss. Right. Oh my god. I, I right. I, I didn't think about it that way. Like you have no choice but to let go of what's yeah. gonna happen next because you just you're just gonna be like pissed and annoyed of like why <laughs> is this taking so long? Yeah. But then so, you know you focus you, on you become one with the moment. Oh spiritual shit man like <laughs> there we go there's the there's the essence of the podcast <laughs> right. oh my god right it, we talked about the wars and we talked about how food conquered the world this is i guess like one of the um episodes that i really really like you know um i i, I love all the episodes but i like this one because of me being a um uh uh geeking out when it comes to history <laughs> and and culture because you know, 
I really love history and food has just a lot, a lot of history. Maybe we could have a second uh, episode, second session about yeah, history we this about, time. <laughs> we, we can talk about a lot of things, you know. Um, food is always tied into our society. And um, I think maybe this is just my ending. Um, let me just go back to the book that I just told you from um, from Ferb and Armilegos, the consumption consuming passions, the anthropology of eating. So again, they said that food is to a large extent what holds society together. So the next time that we actually go out and eat with our friends, the main reason why we miss eating with our friends during this lockdown is not because we're hungry and it's not because right. we're starving. It's because there is this need to be together. There is this Commune. need to commune and to be linked with a deep spiritual experience in that eating together, to know each other, so to say, in the breaking of the bread. Mm -hmm. there we and, go. and just, you know, eating in that sense, if you put it that way, becomes a spiritual experience in, oh, in yeah. a sense, because, you know, bonds are forged. Yes. And bonds are just Hearts are broken. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, hearts are broken. You know, uh, let me just give you this little anecdote. Not really an anecdote, but let me give you an advice. If a guy asks you out, for example, and the guy offers to pay for dinner, if you like the guy, let him pay. If you don't like the guy, pay for it yourself. You'll see something change. Because food is, is meant to be offered, right? Mm -hmm. And if, if you say, no, I'll just buy my own food, you're basically saying, no, I don't want to start yeah. this relationship. So see, food is very powerful. Even if we don't think about it, food actually starts relationships. It also ends them. Right. That's what Sid said. <laughs> yes. You know, you forge friendships, but you can also break hearts. <laughs> you can bind souls together, but we can also um, yeah. sever bonds <laughs> and untether them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, thank you so much, Gino. Um, uh, I definitely love this episode of just like nerding out when it comes to <laughs> um history and and like basically two of my one of two of my favorite things history and food Ooh, yeah, <laughs> together right and, thank you very um, much for having me yeah my thank pleasure you. thank you thank you so much and just to one last question if you could have any food or drink right now anything you could have tried it or maybe you want to try this what would you have right now and why you know what i really would like to eat again is dim sum <laughs> <laughs> oh my god this has been a recurring theme uh, i dim sum has been mentioned multiple times in various episodes <laughs> I miss dim sum for some reason. You know, there, there's there's something homey about dim sum. Maybe there's a distant memory. I, I, I can't retrieve it, but every time I eat dim sum, I don't even have to think about it. I live it back. You know, I, I relive it. Right. You know, oh, my God. Dim sum. I re-experience sure. it. And the I, smell is so familiar. I don't know why, <laughs> but, it, it, you know, when I smell it, it, it brings me back to some memory I had when I was eight or nine years old. <laughs> And I like that. It, it's a warm, bitaw. fuzzy feel feeling. Bitaw, bitaw. And I, I, I don't want to overextend this, but I just realized right now, I cannot, I cannot share this experience when it comes to dim sum with people who are not from Cebu, bitaw. Wala, wala yeah. like, people, like, if I say I miss dim sum, like, if I talk to my friends in, in Manila, they don't, they don't get it. But yeah. if I talk to like people... It's a Cebuano from, thing. It's like, a Cebuano thing. So like we get it. Like I know what yeah. you're saying. You know. Yeah, when you say dim sum, everybody knows. Oh yes. 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 Dim sum. <laughs> like every we could all agree. You know, dim sum <laughs> is is a whole different thing. And I'm glad that I lived in Cebu and I get to experience you know dim sum because when I lived in Manila, it's it's well not well this not exist except for, obviously if you go to Chinatown, but you know, dim sum for sure. Anything else that you want to plug in or you want to shout out or you have any events Ooh. or anything you want to say? All right. Um, insofar as events are concerned, uh, by, by the way, I belong to a poetry group, the Stray Poets Collective. We have our poetry reading night. Please, uh, not, not really, po yeah, it's at night. We'll have our poetry reading night this Saturday. Uh, I forgot our theme, but it's about hearts. <laughs> not heart, but you know, hearts. 
Uh -huh. uh, you can join us. We're in, you know, we'll be live in our Facebook page. Uh, find us at the, the Stray Poets Collective. That's the name of our group. You can find it in your, um, you can just find it in, you know, Facebook. And of course, please support my project. I'm also trying, struggling to create a podcast. I released my first episode, uh, Table Talks with Gino Paradella. You can find me on Spotify. That's All Table right. Talks with Gina Pardella. Okay. So I'll, I'll be releasing the next episode soon. Thank you for this. Okay. Day. Thank you. That's Stray of uh, Stray Poets Collective and, uh, and Table Talks with Gina. But um, this will be released in a few weeks after the event. So, but you can definitely check out. Um... <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We, we will have a lot of events yeah, for, for poetry. There's you know, a lot. Just catch yeah. it up. So just check out his Facebook, yeah. um, the, the Facebook page yeah, and his podcast. Thank you so much, man. Okay. Thank you, Sid. Oh.